Howdy, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Diana Chu here at Slow Gaze. I am your humble Pisces here to talk to you about slowing down, gazing inwards, and all of the good stuff that comes with that. Today we're going to just dive in. I am launching my own 2021 low buy and I recently was on a low buy. It was meant to span half of the tail end of 2020 and then into March 2021. But of course, as you know, 2020 didn't go as planned. Needless to say, I have come out of at least three months of a low buy quite enlightened by my process. And I have five really good tips to help you along if you are new to low buys or if you're starting to get into another one, refreshing this year with something a little more nuanced, a little more refined, and you're trying to sculpt your own process, you've come to the right place. Let's compare our notes. I mean, my five tips are pretty straightforward, but some of these things really are tried and true, and they have helped me with my own journey. So if you're new, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you clicked on this channel. I really would love if you would subscribe and stick around. I post every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Central Time. You can also buy me a coffee down below. I've linked that if you don't know what that means. Every generous donation that I receive goes straight back into my channel to help the quality and the content, but some of it also goes to the ACLU and some other civil liberties initiatives that I find really resonates with me and my values. So just know that your money is going to a good place and um, not just floating around the ether. Thank you again to everyone who has already bought me a coffee. I am so, so humbled by all of your support. So like I said, I have five different tips for you. They're not earth shattering, but some of them, they've got the points. At the end, I guess I'll wrap it up with a little wish list. I'm looking down because I have my notebook in front of me. I do have a list of things that I really want for 2021 and maybe 2022. I've tried to spread it out and you'll see why in a second. I also have a little list of brands that I want to try for 2021 and some that I just kind of want to let fall away or just don't want to care about anymore for various reasons. Most of the reasons would be because of their practices or their historical release of shades and their non-inclusivity. But of course there are so many more and I really need to do my own research with. So the list will be short. It's just a little rattling off, but I would love again to compare notes and see if you have any brands that are sticking out to you that you want to try or ones that you just want to um, buy Felicia. Tip number uno, unsubscribe. Just unfollow, don't watch it, don't see it, don't let any of the paid promotions or influencers or triggering things come at you involuntarily. I think it's really easy to fall under the trap and the mystique of wanting new things if it's constantly coming at you. Of course, there's no way to keep up and that feeling of needing to keep up is only heightened by all of the beautiful things coming at you from many angles. At first, when I did this, I was really afraid of being out of the loop. The FOMO was real, but I felt like I could always go and find that if I wanted to on my own terms, on my own time, I could do it much more at a leisurely pace and I could still go to, let's say, Trend Mood on Instagram. I know that's a really popular beauty news source. I could go drink at that well when I wanted to, but it wouldn't be constant releases coming at me. So I think flipping that script and knowing that you have the power to go find that information and not always just having it come to you is really key. It's total reversal of what we understand because, you know, Instagram is just showing you endless scrolling feeds of stuff that you might be interested in. It's supposed to be tailored to you and your interests. So it doesn't mean that your interests are falling away from beauty or whatever you're looking at. It just means that you have more agency and power into finding those exact releases or things that your favorite brands are doing and it doesn't have to come at you. Sorry for being so repetitive. It really is just one of those things that once I drilled it into my head, it makes so much more sense in this way. I also found out recently that Trend Mood, because it's such an, a large outfit, every brand and every post that it does, there's thousands of dollars behind each post. So it's not an organic feed. It's not just Trend Mood sussing out new releases and, and posting it out so that people can be like, oh, this is nice. Like it's not just a news ticker. There's a lot of vested interest for Trend Mood and a lot of money being passed around behind the scenes. That does affect what gets posted when brands that can't afford this type of promotion. So don't be fooled. It's not just this lovely organic 
Samaritan. Uh, it's a business and you know I love going to Trend Mood. I still love looking at it. I just think it's important to acknowledge. Dose. Let's do a 30 day wait period. Now if you were to tell me previously to sit on something for 30 days before I was allowed to go and buy it, I don't know if that sounds preposterous to you. I think most of us are really in habit of wanting it, seeing it, clicking it, buying it. Ariana Grande in the house. And I get it. I am really trying my best to tamp those feelings down because it's not about the amount of money necessarily. I am so fortunate to be able to start this low buy in a safe financial position and we all have different reasons for doing a low buy. For me, it's more about controlling the amount of stuff that enters my house versus the amount of money that I'm spending. So luckily that's kind of my lens, but please understand that, you know, they overlap quite a bit. And if you are budget strapped, this is really another great way to kind of wean yourself off of those impulse purchases. For me, not buying things and saying, okay, I'm just gonna get one more lip gloss or I'm just gonna get five more items to try out in Sephora. This will be my last purchase, online shipment, like it's all gonna be fine. Those, that happens constantly. <laughs> and then I turn out to have, you know, 20 different orders under my belt in a year. And that's not what I want. I actually want to only buy 20 items this year. I thought about doing 21 items for 21, but then I realized 22 would it mean that I got 22 items in my house. So I just capped it at 20 and that's just going to be my glass ceiling for the rest of eternity, if I could be so naive to say, but that's my goal for now. So 20 items for 21 and writing a list really does help. If you write it at the beginning of every month, you're only allowed to buy from that list in the following month because inevitably, at least for me, I find that some things are no longer relevant or they're, they've lost their shiny novelty sheen and I can really pick out the chaff from the wheat. So I'm able to at least call every month and that if that fire, that burning desire to buy that one lip gloss is still there, I'm allowed to buy it and I'm even more satiated because I've enjoyed both the anticipation and the release. So that to me, that journey is both helping you with not impulse shopping, um, really separating what is just new and shiny from stuff that you know is actually fitting into your lifestyle, stuff you actually want to invite into your home, and you get to extend that anticipation period, that chase, which is actually what gives you most of that dopamine hit. So I really recommend only listing things in the beginning of every month. You can compare month to month what is still on your list and only being able to shop from your previous month's list really might help out. I also think this helps uh, not constantly going back to the same cart and being like, oh, let me chew on my nails, let me sweat on this. I found myself browsing constantly, checking my cart constantly, trying to refine there. And honestly, it, it just spent so much of my waking life to be curating stuff that I don't own. Isn't that insane? <laughs> and I've talked about this before in a different video saying that if you haven't noticed, let's say in Sephora, when you're in your cart, your basket, every time you refresh the page or you add or remove an item, even move it to your loves, it will reshuffle just like a casino display. You're supposed to be awed and wowed every single time. It's supposed to be a different stimulus every time. And that's how they keep you in the basket. If it didn't move and it, if it didn't have that kind of motion, it wouldn't be so exciting. So know that the cart is actually working against you even if you think, oh, it's just play stuff. I'm not going to buy all of this. It's still using its marketing wiles and barbs to keep you on that site. And maybe you'll just have decision fatigue and you'll just check out. And sometimes that happens to me too. So write it down on paper. Don't be fooled into going online and looking at all that beautiful stuff that's photographed really nice, lit from all angles. It has five star reviews. Thousands of people have tried it. Take a step back from all of that and really stick to your lists. Tip three, going by a number of items versus a budget. And I kind of touched on this before because this is not about me spending a dollar amount. Even though when I started my own low buy back in September, 2020, I thought that that's the way to go. Usually that makes sense. You're capping the amount of money you can spend 
and a really great viewer did mention that they don't spend over a certain amount of money because that is the amount of money that uh, on average a man would spend on personal items and personal effects. And I thought that was really wonderful because we have so many more traditional needs as women or as people who want to engage in this type of creative mastery, presentation, like there's a lot of layers to it. I don't wanna be spending so much money on all of this stuff because of some social norm to feel like I am participating in my own femininity in a way that I don't agree with. I love putting on makeup every single day, even during this pandemic year and moving forward, I really enjoy and get a lot of positivity from putting my face on. So that is something that I'm learning about and grappling with and trying to normalize my own face for myself without any makeup on. But the ritual of getting the exact finish of skin that I want or feeling, you know, polished, that is something that still gives me a lot of pleasure. So I, I dive into it and I pay into it, but I don't want to go too far beyond not only my means, but found that tracking the amount of money that I'm spending is not fun for me. What is way better of, of a playing field is saying 20 items only and kind of being that gatekeeper because suddenly you're not valuing something for how much it, it costs. Let's say you buy a pack of hair ties for a dollar at the drugstore and let's say you buy a Tom Ford fragrance for $200, not at the drugstore. Once, you know, you the money has left your hands and those two items come into your life, yes, you have some inherent value and thoughts around those two items, but the tag, the sticker, the price is not attached to those items. So the utility, the pleasure that I get from both of those actually starts to balance out on its own scale. And what I'm getting at is to be able to make a flatter playing field and to say, okay, if I'm only getting 20 items through the door this year, I can see that I'm weighing hair ties against a $200 fragrance and actually seeing that the hair ties are way more important to me. I really need some. Let's say I'm, I don't need hair ties because of my lob, thank you, husband. But suddenly it's not about the price and it's about the utility, the pleasure, and all of the other values. So I found that taking away the money aspect as the overarching all ruling rule, that's really helped actually. So I would highly recommend trying your low buy um, by capping the amount of items. Of course, if you want to set budgetary means or restrictions below that um, and use it kind of as guideposts, I would recommend that as well. Personally, I don't need to do that because I kind of have a sense of what I can and want to afford, but by just cutting down the volume of stuff coming in, easily say that I, I'm still saving money throughout this year. I did start a little graph. I am going to be populating it with all these little thumbnails of things that I buy. These are all non-essential items. These are all wants and they're all selfish and personal to me. So I do live with my husband in this house and we cannot share, let's say, a lipstick. We can't share a hair tie. We could share a cookbook, but if it's a cookbook that only I will use or something that I know he really won't use, it still counts towards my own low buy. I'm not counting replacements, but I do have to finish that full item before I can even buy another thing. This is new to me stuff. This is non-essential items and things that I only can use. So if you wanna join me, I recommend making something like this, a little chart, and putting down the month next to every thumbnail that you get. I've worked it out to have, I guess it's since it's 12 months and 20 items, I can have um, two items per month for most months. Four months out of the year, I'll only get to buy one thing. And so I've kind of mapped it out in my head and on paper to say, when should I be buying things? And would it be seasonally correct to be buying a pair of denim cutoffs, for example, in winter? Not so much. So I've tried to kind of pace it out for myself and that way I can look forward to another month and that reward. Again, extending that anticipation feeling. I've also allotted myself those two items, that two item limit, uh, for November specifically, because I know that Black Friday and cyber deals are happening. Everything else I can comfortably manage within my own budget, within my own means, every month if it's only one or two items. See how that works for you. Okay, 
Number four, let's talk about lifespan of a product. Let's go back to that hair tie thing. Even if you buy 25 hair ties and you think, okay, this is just gonna be a thing for me when I go to the gym or when I do yoga down in the basement, this is just one and done utility. It's not cute, it's not as crunchy, and we rarely think about all of the other things that come with that item. So not only do you have to find a good way to store it, I always find that storing hair ties is a pain because they inevitably leave their little case or stack. They have hair in them, they start to migrate all over, I lose them, and it's just not an elegant experience. Ask that of all of your items, to have a place for it, to have an elegant experience, to be able to live in your house and you know exactly where they are at all times and know that this should last you not only 30 days or whatever, but much longer than that because in the end, these are not gonna get recycled. They are going to go in the trash. There's so much more to that, to just that one decision of buying a pack of hair ties that we have to be aware of. So let me use another example. Let's say I buy a blush, but I can't decide on which color to get, so I get three without thinking. I definitely rationalize it in my head saying, I need something that's in the pink range, I need something in the peach range, and then I need something berry toned for those cool tone looks that I do sometimes. And I'm like, mm, I'm gonna use all three of them equally and they're going to give my life such the boost that I need, and I buy all of three of them without thinking about the lifespan. Now, I gather that many of us here would not even dream in our lifetime to do such a thing with pets, something with life. I wouldn't say, oh, let me go to the SPCA, pick out three different puppies, one that's super cute, one that's super chunky, and one that has no hair because I'm allergic, and I'll see which one fits my lifestyle and what I want to do with them afterwards. We wouldn't do that. And I know that's such a hyperbolic example, but it really is another way of thinking about lifespan. Because once you get the puppies home, you have to nurture them, love them, clean up after them, do so much with them. And then at the end of their life, which is inevitable, that's something you also have to emotionally bear and something that you have to do physically. <laughs> I know, again, that's a really heavy example, but if we apply it to something that's physical, that you're going to be living with every single day, I think, if it's makeup. It's in your most intimate sanctum, it's in your bathroom, which is a place that you frequent. It's in maybe your vanity or your living, dreaming, sleeping space. And that's something that, you know, affects you if it's around you. And once you're done with this product, which could be in the next few weeks, months, or even years, you still have to figure out how to get rid of it. And of course, most of us are more eco-friendly minded and we're trying to either pass it along, even though it expires, or we're trying to recycle it or reuse it or whatnot. But in the end, most makeup goes into the trash. And unfortunately, that is something that we rarely spend time thinking about, thinking about the impact of not only the lifespan it had with us, but the item's lifespan, just even getting to you, getting to that store, getting produced, all the hands that had to pass through, yada yada, all the way back ad infinitum into the beginning of time, it's there, even though we don't see it. So thinking about that lifespan a little bit and really applying that lens of introducing something into your life that if it had life, you'd think twice or three times or four times about it, and most likely you wouldn't get it. Whereas something inanimate, it should kind of be held to a similar reverence. I know it's not the same, I'm not trying to say that inanimate objects are the same as living, breathing, wonderful animals. It wouldn't harm us to be thinking about all of our resources as something that is connected to this earth, to this holistic ecosystem that is a living, breathing, full of energy thing that we can affect and we might as well just take it a little more seriously. So my fifth and final tip here would be to declutter. And I may have been gracing your screens with my declutters. You may have come to this channel because you've seen some of my declutters. I really haven't done that many, but one of them just kind of got some traction. And I know that a lot of people are coming here because they've seen me go through my entire makeup collection. Now my makeup collection is still on the up, but I'm trying to make it on the down and really culling this year. And 
through all of my stages of decluttering and my thought processes. I've also had, you know, purgatory boxes, makeup set aside that if I don't remember it, once I revisit it and had that distance with that stuff, I usually find that it doesn't have that same hold on me. And I've tried different ways of decluttering. It doesn't matter what method you take. What I think matters most is seeing how reducing the overall amount of something can affect the relative need for something. So again, starting with that abstract, let's use a different example. Let's say you are a college student and you just graduate, you get your first job and you have a little bit of income coming in and you are able to rent this apartment that has more than one room. Wow, how wonderful is that once you move from your dorm space or your basement or whatever you were living in into a space of your own that has far more space that you even know what to do with. You bring your thrifted chair, your wonky desk, your futon, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with all this space? Now you go and you spend your very first paycheck on a candelabra. Don't know why, you just saw it on Instagram, but it's the perfect aesthetic, it's kind of mod, really avant-garde, and it's got like twisty turns to it. You've seen it on Instagram, it's great. You bought it. It doesn't match your wonky chair, crusty futon. Unfortunately, you're looking for an upgrade once you get that candelabra and you're like, okay, I need a really cute rug. I need some throw pillows for this new couch that I bought. I need a few more wicker pieces in this house. Like it starts to creep upwards. And I can only say that it's exactly the same opposite. So if you start to remove all of the things around your collection, let's say eyeshadow, because that's really a pain point for me, lipsticks and eyeshadows. I remember when I just had that Urban Decay Naked palette. Don't know if it was the original, certainly wasn't the ones that just came out in a slew, you know, the cherry, honey, um, heat even. It was one of the first three original ones. And that was the only palette I needed. And I knew exactly which tones I would reach for, in what order, with one brush that it came with. And now uh, I bought so many eyeshadow palettes that I didn't give myself the time to live and play with each of them. So then I started growing my collection exponentially and I couldn't keep up so it got even more confusing and actually paralyzing because I had so many different things and of course I started with ones that looked a little bit more tame then I started to get into pressed glitter palettes pressed pr pigment palettes I started being numb to all the prices that I was spending too at first I would never blink at a Pat McGrath or a Natasha Denona palette and that creep was so real. I remember the first time I bought a Natasha Denona palette, it was the Tropic palette, and I thought I was just going to be that girl. Green eyeshadow, Tropic blue, that beautiful muted lavender, and those toppers. I, I was just going to go all out. I was wearing all black at that time. Nothing much has changed. I wasn't wearing those colors on my eyes. It was just so far beyond my reality, and yet it sparked all of my fantasy selves that I bought it and once I was in the gate and I bought something for 129 US dollars, I think that was it. I was then able to drop another 129 for this, drop 125 for this. And I built my collection to a point where it was just suffocating and mind numbing. I had 78 eyeshadow palettes. And again, if you haven't seen those declutters, I will link the eyeshadow one up above, but I also have a playlist on less stuff, and this is probably going into that playlist. So if you want to see more of my minimalist journey and a lot more declutters, start there. Needless to say, I bought way too many colorful, beautiful palettes that just looking at them gave me joy, but I just wasn't using them. And of course, that gave me some guilt, some remorse. I had to store them, the lifespan thing again and it just wasn't a practical thing. So I know many of you have reached out about what I do with my makeup. I do say in some of the description boxes and verbally that I do try my best, try my best to hand off my makeup to people that I know. Um, it's not about nepotism or anything. It really is just people like to know who they're getting their makeup from. I also have plenty of girlfriends and friends that just want makeup that I buy. And so I'm able to pass it on to those people and family members first. 
And then I go and try to find women's shelters donation points to be able to hand off things that are very lightly used. And then I honestly toss the rest. I am not going to put anything on Depop. I won't be sending you any of the makeup. I'm so sorry, but that's just something that I've um, decided. And I really appreciate you respecting that choice. So back to the decluttering, if you find that you're getting a little overwhelmed or confused with your makeup, that's a very normal feeling and you're not alone. So feeling confused about something usually can be alleviated by reducing the amount of choices that you have. So whether or not you wanna do a declutter straight off the bat or doing more of a makeup purgatory idea or making your own makeup capsule, that's a great way to start lifting the fog of confusion and seeing what really works for you. So that's it. Those are my five. I really hope you enjoyed those five tips. I'd love to hear your own tips down below. I read every single comment. I'm not able to reply to all of them, but just now that I'm watching um, very creepily from above. <laughs> yeah, let's just round this video out with some of my wish list items. Now, I'm gonna start with the brands that I have yet to try. Probably not going to try every every single brand in this year. So this is a non-exhaustive list. So there's Adept Cosmetics, Lunar Cosmetics. I don't know, can someone <laughs> educate me? Is that tied to Manny MUA? Or does he just have some eyeshadow palettes that he's created with them? Wasn't quite sure about them, but I am interested in their beautiful colorways. You know, their stories seem really nice. So I was excited about that. I did see Nomad. I did kind of like their color stories as well. I've never tried Persona Cosmetics, but again, that's another one that's kind of on my radar, but I've never taken the plunge. Besame Cosmetics, love their historical lean, how much research and development goes into all those products and just kind of one true singular brand story and brand experience. So I think they're really lovely. Um, they also feature a lot of red lipsticks and that's something that I'm personally into. So maybe best May one day. Um, Beauty Bakery for sure. I've always wanted that, uh, I've wanted a lot of their stuff. Even their uh, metallic lip whips, super interested in their highlighters and some of their like ne Neapolitan blush bars. Oh. There's some of their stuff that just, it looks so yummy. I know their flour um, baking powder is really popular, but I don't use powders. So I've never needed to take the plunge, but I really want to support them. Elsa Perez, um, she has a couple things that are interesting. Not only her eyeshadows that look really nice, but I think some like lip glosses and oof, just, they look like they're really nice, clean beauty products. Colored Rain, Alamar Cosmetics, love, what they're doing with their blush and bronzer bars. Really interested in that. I also like their um, lip stuff, that looks good. Sunny's Face, I've heard of them. I know they're out of the Philippines, so they're harder to get, especially stateside. Sure, they give me a lot of feelings and I love their jelly pouches and their colorways. It feels like it would work well for someone with my undertones. Thrive Cosmetics, I've been seeing so many eye brightener crayon promotions and I follow Kaki Reviews Beauty here on YouTube. I'll link her down below if you don't know who she is, but she has some strong Aries vibes, right? Right? She's an Aries, right? Am I crazy? Now I'm like, maybe she's a Libra. Oh man, I'm all mixed up. But she's really into horoscopes, zodiac, all that good stuff. Um, and she loves Thrive Cosmetics, particularly that eye brightening pen, the shade M-U-N-A, so Muna love how taupey that is and it looks really nice on so many different skin tones um for me i'm afraid it's a little too purple or slightly too gray i also have extremely hooded eyes and a lot of creasing or just tiny baby creases that uh, i'm not sure how much brightening it'll do i also don't really have a, a perfect little inner corner that i attend to each time so not sure about it i'm still on the fence and then of course queen danessa myricks herself I'm so interested in her, I think it's color foil, color fix, color FX foil. Please excuse, I just have Danessa Myricks written down. Milky Way, that really sparkly one, and Jelly Bean, which is a neon orange. I've seen them used on YouTube and I just want something really punchy and graphic. Like those are my fun color things. The few brands that I want to just say meh, meh, pass, goodbye <laughs> for 2021 is Hourglass, their shade range, need I say more? NARS, 
Uh, God, I really love NARS. Fever for them has waned over the years. Some stuff still really gets me. You know, they don't need my support. They've got, they've got other supporters. They're also not cruelty free, I think, because they sell in China. I also think um, when I looked into some of their blushes, the ingredients were very paraben heavy. So I'm trying to avoid parabens, BHT, and PTFE or whatever it's called. I think it's PTFE. The trade name is actually Teflon. So I haven't found PTFE in NARS products yet. Um, I only mentioned that because one of my favorite blushes that I found last year, and I've linked that down below as well, that was in my signature look video where I, I bought the same products that Joanna Gaines of Magnolia and Fixer Upper. Her makeup kit, I like bought straight up. The blush just is probably my favorite blush almost of all time. I want to say it's of my favorite blush of all time, but the one thing that really gets me is that it's full of fragrance and full of PTFE. Okay, I won't say it's full of. It's just, it's part of the ingredients list, and unfortunately, I don't like the idea of putting Teflon on my face every single day. Sure, it might not get absorbed into my face. I'm not going to eat it because it's on my cheeks, but it's just something that uh, I, I can't, with great conscience, live with. PTFE itself isn't harmful, but the making of it to actually create that chemical, you have to use something called PFOA, I think, and that is cancerous. That is environmentally damaging. So again, it's just something that I can't buy all the time, but I have it in my little sweaty paws and I will use it up as much as I can. Too Faced, also don't need to say much about that. Huda, I mean, she's got great stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I, I'm really excited about. Every time she launches, my heart skips a beat. And I really love her larger palettes, the ones that are made in Italy. Huda's great, but um, I did buy her Nani palette and then I promptly returned it. Her color stories just lean way too purple, pink, burgundy. It doesn't fit me. I want something bronzy, warm toned, um, really neutral. And her stuff is really neutral, but in a different way. So I just need to take a break from her stuff. And then House Labs. I wrote this down with a question mark. I do love Lady Gaga. She will always be my home slice. She gives me all the feels. I know she's really about her craftsmanship and she wants to do the best and make, you know, good makeup. But I just haven't heard great things about her stuff and I'm just gonna give it some time. Just gonna pass on it this year. I have so many other brands that I would rather support. She also does not need my personal support. There you have it. Those are my brands that I wanna try and the ones that I'm like, nah, see you later till next year, maybe. The last disclaimer I have is just saying that I'm on a journey. <laughs> I'm still doing my own research, still backing up my own ideas figuring it out for myself. And I really encourage you to also do your own legwork and, and find your own uh, values and see how the brands that you shop from align to them. And that's all part of the slow gaze ethic. I really want this to be a place where we can talk about things. Also gaze more inwards. It's going to evolve over time. There's just no way around it. So thank you so much if you're still with me. I hope you'll consider subscribing. I would just love to see you back here. I hope you're having a wonderful 2021 beginning. It has been an insane start to 2021. I really hope that everyone is staying safe. We're all in this together. We're all brothers and sisters. I encourage us all to lead with love and an open ear. Stay safe out there. I will talk to you very, very soon. Adios. Should only fill this